Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we live like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. We're missing Brian Broom today. But we're picking up the story that we started last week with Deborah and Barak and the Battle of Megiddo. I think when we stopped, the Lord had just shown his might over Baal and Ashtaroth by turning nature against the Canaanite forces. Sorry, was it the Canaanite forces? Yes, it was the Canaanite, the Canaanite forces. forces. Great. So what happens next, Greg? <laughs> well, as Barak, Barak looks around, he notices that the enemy general is nowhere to be seen. Sisera has fled the battlefield. <gasps> He's gone. He's gone. And so he and his men start out looking for him, but he has a, he has a head start. And he comes, as Providence would have it, to the encampment of his old friend Heber the Kenite. This, Heber was a um, descendant of Moses' father-in-law. Uh, that whole family had joined with Israel in their journeys in the wilderness and into the promised land. But this, the, the cat is making noise. Um, <laughs> but this particular gentleman had decided that getting in bed with the Canaanites was more profitable than being faithful to the covenant he had with Israel. So he'd moved away from the rest of his family. He was living up north near the, um, the Canaanite strongholds. And in fact, he was the one who, or his people, had pointed out to Sisera, hey, Barak's up there with a bunch of guys on the mountain. You might want to do something about that. So uh, Sisera thinks this would be a safe place to go, as safe place goes, go. Then, <laughs> so he runs. He runs on foot because mud. You're, you're, you're not, the chariots are not working. The horses are not working. So he plop, 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 plop through the mud and comes to the encampment. Well, Heber's not around apparently, but his wife, Jael, is. And this is what the text says. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in, turn in to me, fear not. And when he turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink, and covered him again. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here? That thou shalt say, No. So, here's Sisera. He's tired, worn out, exhausted, filthy, muddy up to the who knows what. And here's this nice lady who invites him in to her tent. There are already some problems here. Now, hospital, we've seen before in an earlier uh, podcast, hospitality ranked very high among the virtues that people in the Middle East value and still value today. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we really don't have anything like it that we can really relate to. To violate the rules of hospitality was to become an outcast among your people, even if that violation was uh, to do harm to an enemy. It didn't matter. Anybody who came to your encampment, who uh, drank water with you, ate salt with you, ate a meal with you, uh, was was became a family member was under your absolute protection, and you you were the lowest scum to everybody, friends and foes alike, if you did not protect them. But that structure came with a few rules, like uh, you go to the head of the sheikdom, the head of the this little encampment thing, and you talk to the the husband father. You don't go around him and talk to the women. You do not go into the women's tents. Men and women generally had separate tents, and even husbands and wives had separate tents. Remember that Abraham and Sarah each had their own uh, their own tent, their own room, their own territory. So you didn't do that. You didn't make demands of your host or hostess because <laughs> you're a guest. A please might, might, might make it, but anything short of that, no. And in theory, such places should be neutral zones. You don't bring the battle to the encampment. You certainly don't bring it into your host's wife's 
bedroom. <laughs> and, of course, you obviously don't ask your host's wife to lie for you when your host isn't even there. So his violations of even the the one thing that might def, might defend him, the rules of hospitality, he violates left and right. And about the only appeal you could raise here, well, but they're so high that even if he violates them, you shouldn't. Yeah, that's pushing it, especially when we see what kind of man this is, and we'll get to that in a bit. But jail is moving subtly. <laughs> She's got a plan. He know, she knows that he's worn out, that he's exhausted and will easily fall asleep. She, she gives him, it says milk in a bottle. Remember, bottle doesn't mean a glass bottle. It means some kind of animal skin container. And what? And since there was no refrigeration, what the text is describing is something that we would register more as yogurt or milk curds mm -hmm. or something like that. But still, milk for small children. And um, she takes a mantle, piece of... You know, it's not an army blanket. It's, 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 it's a nice piece of her clothing and lays it over him twice because at one point he interrupts to, to tell her some things. And, and, and she puts him at his ease. Don't be afraid. Mommy jail's got you covered. Well, then stand in the door. And if anyone comes along and they say, is there any man here? Say no. <laughs> the passage drips with irony at this point because... He's not acting like a general. He's not acting like a man. He's acting like a scared little baby who's asking a woman who is not his wife, not even his mother, certainly not his hired bodyguard, to defend him and to lie to the soldiers he assumes will probably come eventually, again, endangering her life. But He's hey, also go ahead. assuming that she's not a threat of any kind. Oh, no, no. She's a woman. How yeah. could she be a threat? <laughs> right. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to... We're going to look at Deborah's song next time round, and we'll, we'll see a little more of what kind of guy this Cicero was. But he was not nice to women, shall we say. He viewed them as objects to be used for his own pleasure. There's no tenderness here. There's no respect. There's just, what? Can, how can I use you right now? And the other side of that is, and when I'm re fully rested, how can I use you then? She knows this. She, I mean, she's, she's seen this guy come to camp before. She's seen him hang out with her husband. She may have seen his uh, leers and stares in the past and realized, I'm not safe with this guy. And yet here he is, and here she is inviting him into the tent and promising that she will keep him safe. Well, here's where the text picks up. The jail, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, jail came out to meet him and said to him, come and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. She kills him. <laughs> there are many colorful adjectives you could throw in just to punctuate it. But the bottom line is she kills him. Her weapons are a tent peg and a hammer. These were women's instruments. Our equivalent maybe is a frying pan full of hot grease smacked directly into the guy's face. Cast iron. That's cast something. iron. Oh, absolutely cast iron. Sure. Or maybe just drop, dropping a microwave on his head, um, <laughs> depending on how modern and up-to-date you are in your kitchen, I suppose. <laughs> how uh, domestic. Yeah, how domestic you are. This was, she She didn't go for a sword. She didn't go for a javelin. She may or may not have had such things around, but she would not have been terribly well practiced with them under any circumstances. But she was good at swinging at, uh, a mallet to, to smash tent pegs in the ground because in those days it was women's work to set up the tents. We can look at that however we want. That was the cultural reality of the thing. She went for what she was familiar with, what she felt she was capable and competent with, but she knew she had only one shot. Because mm -hmm. if she misses, 
or if she creaks too loud or rustles too much, he may wake up. And if she doesn't get him the first time, she will be dead probably after being raped um, because he's that kind of guy. He will, he will make her existence miserable before he ends her life. So she has to be very brave to pull this off. Yes, he's asleep, but warriors are often used to waking up real fast, the sound of, you know, broken twig or something. So she is, she's taking a risk. We, we must give her that. She's not, she hasn't drugged him, strictly speaking. Yeah, the, the milk is kind of a sophomoric, so he's probably a little more sleepy than he might otherwise be. There are no guarantees here. And so with her strong arm and her handy tools, she takes one shot and she gets it. She puts the nail right through his temple and fastens it to the ground with one pound. She must have been very, That's very incredible, strong. That's incredible, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how sharp that tent peg is, yeah. whether it's sharp at all, which I mean, like, I'm picturing like a railroad spike. Yeah, probably. Which is not all that sharp. I don't know. But like, even if it were sharpened, that's a lot of force. <laughs> that's a lot of force because it not only goes through the head, not just she kills him, she fastens him to the ground. She nailed him. <laughs> oh! <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> And uh, not a few commentators have pointed out the um, <clears throat> double entendre there, the, the <laughs> phallic significance mm -hmm. of the tent peg, because we're going to see in Deborah's song that rape on the battlefield was just standard practice. Mm -hmm. Even the Canaanite women assumed that that's what was going on, and that's why Cicero was late. They, the army was busy raping the women, and, you know, when they're done, they'll come home. This gives us an idea of where this guy learned his manners. Hmm. But again, we'll more about that next time. So God calls for an eye for an eye or something like that. <laughs> and when Barak shows up with his guys, Jael goes out to meet him and says, come on, show you the guy you're looking for. And there he is, dead. The nail's still in his temple. She didn't bother to remove it. And the next word is so, so God subdued. This is this this twofold strike, God's dumping the waters on the plains of Megiddo so that the Canaan army was useless, and so surrendering it to uh, to Barak's army. And the second strike, jail nailing Sisera to the ground, are the means whereby God subdued. The Canaanites. But again, it's at this point, well, yes, God in his providence does many wonderful things and uses uses the wrath of men to praise him. And he means many things for good that we mean for evil, blah, 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 blah. I want to read just some of the things that some of the commentators have said about jail. They have not been nice to her at all. Kyle and Delich, the, uh, the German commentators, accuse her of the sins of lying, treachery, and assassination. Another... Or lawful execution. <laughs> Another writer, Kendall, speaks of callous efficiency, treachery, and murder in cold blood. Another gentleman named... No, she's just <laughs> not being Batman, you know? She's actually taking care of the problem. Yes. Sorry. I, I, have, I have zero sympathy for these commentators. <laughs> Another man named Block describes Jail as a proto-feminist whose actions challenge the prevailing views of female roles in general and the relationship of husband and wife in particular. See, her husband had made a covenant with this guy, and she's unilaterally withdrawing from that covenant and turning on her husband's guest, her husband's covenant. Uh, you mean this husband who wasn't there to yeah. protect her from yeah. the rapist who came into her house? <laughs> yeah, that one. That husband right there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> You're such a proto-feminist, don't we? Uh, <laughs> and Edersheim, who usually is sensible... Blames her for sacrificing the sacred rights of hospitality to her dark purpose. <laughs> you mean crushing the head of the serpent? <laughs> crushing the head of the serpent. Yeah. Now, I I got a, a mild reproof on mentioning, I don't know if it was in this case or another one, some place where the, the woman crushes the serpent. Said, yeah, you you got to be careful with that because that smacks of Rome. 
You know what? what well, you know Rome. Of turned, Rome. Rome. Roman Catholicism, because Roman Catholicism makes Mary the co-mediatrix who also helps stamp out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I really had nothing to say. You can't to... see me, listeners, but I'm giving a look. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you know, uh-huh. you have not read enough of of the Bible to see how often God and, and this man is not ignorant of Scripture. But you know, mm-hmm. the the pre- and here's the thing: the presuppositions you bring to the text easily can blind you to the plainest meaning of the text at times. Mm-hmm. And, and we're, we'll, we'll see some this time, we'll see some more next time, of what the text actually says about jail. Mm-hmm. Not, not Yes, obviously God's providence to use here, no kidding. <laughs> but what does the text say about her as a person in her actions? As a moral agent. As a moral what agent. What judgment does it pronounce? Right. Well, the first thing that we have is the prophecy of, of Deborah. Deborah said because that Barak would not step up to the plate without Deborah holding his hand, that God was going to give the honor and the victory, the glory of the battle to a woman. He was going to sell his sister into the hand of a woman. And and apparently Barak was fine with this. You know, see any protest of, oh, rats. I don't care. <laughs> a girl. <laughs> yeah, girl. I mean, it's kind of hard to say that when he's saying, I'm not going into battle unless this <laughs> yes. woman goes with me. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is the only time in scripture where a woman is deliberately put on the battlefield, not as a warrior, but simply, as I said before, as a teddy bear. Um, <laughs> that may be a little a little cheeky to Barak, but he wanted a visible token of God's presence. The only one he had happened to be a woman and a prophetess. Uh, and it wouldn't have mattered much had it been a teddy bear or the Ark of the Covenant or whatever, you know, wanting something more than God's word. God can work with that, and he does. And Barak goes down in the hall of, of faith as, as a great hero. And, and yet it's clear that he slips a little. And the, the rebuke is slight. The cost is slight. And Barak probably didn't care on the other end a whole lot, at least in terms of his own glory and honor. The Canaanites are defeated, and he goes on as a general to win a great battle against the remaining forces and taking down their king. Uh, but there's anyway, there's that. God had said this was going to happen. Well, again, that's just God telling us how providence is going to unfold. It doesn't say anything about our character. Fine. The next thing we can look at is the the tone, the ironic tone of the uh, holy writer, who may have been Samuel, may have been someone else. But in describing this whole scene, he is ridiculing and mocking Sisera before and in the light of jail. Jail is the responsible adult here (laughs) doing the adult thing of protecting her tent and her encampment from an invader. And Sisera is the little baby who needs to have a bottle of milk and be tucked in, and who admits there's no man here, and denies his own masculinity implicitly. Mm. And, and, and so, if it, you know, when you, come to, when you come to any text of any sort, you do have to take into account the tone of the narrator. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something they teach you, well, maybe not English 1B, but someplace I hope very soon <laughs> after that. Should be before that. <laughs> I mean... No, I, I High didn't. school English? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> the, the voice of, of the narrator, and, and these are things I learned in, in some part from my wife that I just kind of noted intuitively or didn't note at all, depending. What kind of narrator do we have? Do we have an impartial narrator? Do we have an honest narrator? Do we have uh, a naive narrator? Uh, what are we working Well, here we're working with a divinely inspired narrator and his <laughs> attitude towards Sisera is the guy's a jerk and worse and is a big, big crybaby. And he's getting from jail exactly what he deserves. And there is no hint of reproof in the text to jail whatsoever. The the inspired writer could have dropped a hint to say, well, you know, the pagan gets a death at the hand of the pagan, something along those lines. It wouldn't take It wouldn't have taken much to drop something in like that. Uh, you 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 run to you run to traitors and you get betrayed, you know. There, there's a possible thing there, but it's not. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, the Bible's very clear about that in other places where 
you know, God uses a pagan nation to punish Israel and said, it's not because they're righteous <laughs> that I'm using them. It's because yeah. they're here. <laughs> they're here. <laughs> That's you know? exactly. Uh, but when we do finally move into the Song of Deborah, and we'll, we'll just take a glance at it now and, and, and come back to it in more detail next week. The first time that well, this is the song that Deborah and Barak sing, she seems to be the singer, he's probably the accompanist, after the battle, and it gets published and, and spread throughout Israel, all the watering holes in every place, everybody's singing the song, it's in the top 20 or top 10. It, um, <laughs> she says, verse um, 6, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, the travelers walked through the byways. She's giving a name to the time she lives in. She gives it two names. One, it is the days of Shamgar. Now, now we know about Shamgar from uh, chapter 3, verse 31, and he only gets one verse. After uh, Ehud, I think it's after Ehud, yeah, uh, was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew uh, of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. He had also delivered it. So he was working down south about the same time this was happening up north. Anath is actually the name of a pagan goddess. So he may have been a Gentile convert, or at least uh, mm -hmm. someone rescued out of an apostate household who had come back to the faith, whoever he was. We don't know a whole lot, except that he used an ox goat, which is a weird kind of weapon and a surprise weapon. You don't generally stand in front of a whole army and say, I've got an ox goat, bring it on. It's kind of thing you're, you're poking at your oxen and the soldiers go by, and the moment they're, they're by, you goad them very forcefully. <laughs> and whether he took out 300 at once or, three, or 600 at once or 600, one or two or three at a time, we're not told. Nor does it matter. But he had done enough to earn himself a name. And in the South, he, he was big stuff, whether he thought himself that or not, but but. He had the reputation. And so Jael acknowledges this is his age. But right beside that, she says, in the days of Jael. She doesn't say in the days of Barak. She does not say in the days of Deborah. She does not just leave it alone and figure that one identification is enough. She puts <laughs> Jael side by side with Shamgar. And they do have the thing in common of they kind of come out of nowhere. They have pointy weapons that are not weapons. They're just ordinary tools. And their actions lead to the deliverance of Israel. And mm -hmm. she feels comfortable putting them side by side. Now, if Shamgar is judge, you know, Jael isn't. But if Shamgar is a judge, then he was full of the spirit, was acting in faith. And yet, Deborah does not hesitate to set Jael right beside him and give her name to this age. That's pretty startling. Of course, there's one easy way around it. Deborah didn't know what she was talking about. Yes, she's a prophetess, but that doesn't mean everything she said was prophecy, let alone true. So, yeah, no. Women. Would you make that argument about <laughs> any other passage of scripture? Written Not unless you're a liberal, which is why it's amazing <laughs> that conservatives do exactly that. They they look at it and say, yeah, no, this isn't because um, they've come with their preconceived notions. This isn't ladylike. This isn't delicate. This isn't how women behave. This is a woman taking initiative, as you say, when her <laughs> oh, husband's not there. My yes, heavens. We, don't want, we don't want them taking initiative. I mean, pretty soon they might be reading, thinking, getting, <laughs> getting ideas. Getting ideas, yeah, thinking. Exactly. The other thing, well, there are a number of other things. Saving most of them for next week. When she, when Deborah comes to tell the story of Jael in some detail, she starts with this Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. <laughs> I don't hear any Roman Catholics singing hymns to Jael, and I can't understand why. Yeah. Um, well, you, of course, jumped exactly to the point. The words do appear one more time in Scripture. Blessed art thou among women. In other words, the Gabriel spoke to Mary in announcing the birth of Jesus. And, and, and so, again, if you don't want to take it for what it's worth, you can scream coincidence. 
Like, yeah, these both happen and God put them both in the Bible, but God's never dreamed anyone would connect the one with the other. <laughs> That's not only Deborah's, first of all, her, her judgment concerning Jael as a moral agent, but it is also something that Gabriel and Luke pick up and make sure we know about with reference to Mary. When Gabriel said it, he's an angel. He'd been around a long time. For all we know, he was there at the time. Certainly, you know, <laughs> it was in the Heavenly Gazette and things like that. He knew what Deborah had said. <laughs> I imagine uh, we're told that uh, the angels desire to look into the things written by the prophets. So, you know, they, they, he's thumbing his copy of Judges in heaven and saying, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and so when he sent in, in the messages, oh, and by the way, tell her she's blessed above women. Got it. <laughs> this is going to be so cool. I want to shock a lot of people. I thought they'd at least believe. <laughs> and Dr. Luke says, no, oh, the angel said that. You mean he called you jail? Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. How about honored? Except she acted in a moment of history to save the promise. You're bringing forth the promise. So Ma Mary is even greater. But what jail did was crucial. This is a life and death struggle for the for the, the promise, for the salvation of the world. If Sisera gets away and gets back to Jabin and they're able to call up some more soldiers, I mean, the, those chariots are still mired out there. The Canaanites can't use them, but neither can Barak. And they, they have no experience with them anyhow. He can't be allowed to escape. They've got to get him. And so far, he's eluded them. And so if Jabin does not do what she does... The faith of the world is really hanging in the balance. Could God raise up help elsewhere? Of course he could. But as we look at the historical situation, there's none apparent. And God obviously did ordain this particular path. And Deborah celebrates it. Blessed above women is Jael, the, son, the wife of Heber. Here are some other things the commentators say uh, about this. They, acknowledging, okay, she kind of did a good thing, but... How how far do we push this? <laughs> and 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 maybe she just did it to curry favor with the winning side, to get on the winning side. Maybe this is a special case that she had divine revelation she should do this. And anyway, why doesn't she give thanks to Yahweh for this great victory? Well, here's what some people have said. Uh, Matthew Henry and John Gill appeal to a divine impulse on her spirit. They can't come up with any, they can't see any precedent in scripture for the woman defending herself in her home. <laughs> uh, because after all, you know, she lied. She didn't take him on in a fair fight. Oh, how that has ravaged Western civilization. <laughs> Here, I, I have to kill you fairly. Have a sword. We'll fight this like men. What? No, just cut his throat. What is the big deal here? <laughs> but that's not honorable and fair. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is war. You don't. Man. This is war. Come, come out in the open where I can see you and we can kill each other yeah. like men. So you put down your rock and I'll put down my sword like, and actually, we'll like kill God each other intended. like civilized people. It's the line but, from the play. Yeah. From the movie. Oh, like God intended. Um, but oh. I mean, these are two great <laughs> commentators. For whom I have enormous, enormous respect, yeah. but well, I mean, come on. Okay. You can't so, find anything. At least they admit that she, well, what she did was know. right and that it was God's plan, but they just can't find any precedent in yeah. scripture for it. And so they say, she did right, but don't do this at home, kids. So I'm not familiar with John Gill, but Matthew Henry, I've read a little bit from. Yeah. And this seems typical of his kind of whimsy, honestly. <laughs> like he and Spurgeon both... <laughs> Like, I, I'm just like, you're making leaps and you're not showing me and you're just you're <laughs> making things that sound nice, but I'm, I'm not following your biblical reasoning here. <laughs> well, I, just... I haven't had that experience with Matthew Henry, but neither is he my first go-to guy, largely because he's devotional and that's <laughs> usually not the kind of work I'm doing. I, I wholeheartedly recommend him in general. Uh, John Gill is a Reformed Baptist, more or less, let's say, Mara. And except on the era, on the issue of baptism, he's really, really good. His writing style is is um, special. It'll be sort of like, so having looked at this text, we may 
conclude that it was not A, it was not B, it was not C, it was not E, it was not F, nor was it G, but rather it was, and that's one sentence. <laughs> but he's right, and he knows he knows Hebrew thoroughly, and he knows the he, he's read all of the relevant Hebrew historians and scholars, and so, and 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 he's working like Matthew Henry. They're working with the received text, not with modern corruptions of the text. So generally good guys and and so in a way it is a little startling to me a little and, and certainly displeasing that they can't make the connection here and, and i think a lot of it does have to do with well she didn't wake him up and give him a fair warning first I, and, and and that i i don't understand <laughs> um so uh, no i don't think they do it but again the other some of the other commentators are well she's usurping the man's role Where's the man? Thank you very much. He's the one who, her husband is the one who made a deal with the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. That she had gone along this far is to her credit. But when the Antichrist shows up in your bedroom and asks for a little bit of rest with plans for later. You smash him with a hammer. You smash him with a hammer. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, this does not seem a hard thing. And yet so many of the commentators just really, really struggle with it. Um, I think I had, yeah, here's one. Um, Jameson of Jameson Fawcett and Brown say, says that the eulogy, Deborah's eulogy, must be considered as pronounced not on the moral character of the woman and her deed, but on the public benefits, which in the overruling providence of God would flow from it. So she's blessed. Her actions are blessed. She's not. Not her decisions. <laughs> not her decisions, her will, her soul, or mm -hmm. any such thing. And again, Edersheim, who most of the time is, is very sensible, says this, there is, as it seems to us, not a word in scripture to express its approbation of so horrible a deed of deceit and violence. No, not even in the praise which Deborah in her song bestows upon Jael. Now, as far as I know, he doesn't explain himself. I don't. I didn't leave any note to myself about any kind of further explanation. But he goes to. He goes as far as says. There's nothing in Scripture that approves what she did, and that includes Deborah's prophecy or what Deborah said. Hmm. So is he saying it's not prophecy? It's not yeah. inspired, or there's some way of interpreting it other than the obvious face value? <laughs> yeah. We would kind of like to know what hermeneutic you're working with to pull that one off. Mm -hmm. So again, again, we're dealing with with this type of moralism. Uh, that unfortunately has given a certain a certain advantage to uh, post Christian feminism. I mean, when this is how men are going to think about women and their actions, it's easy to see why women will say, "You guys are a bunch of jerks." I mean, really, here here's a woman. She's she is face to face with the Antichrist for that hour. Yes, she lies to him. Yes, she deceives him, kind of like the serpent did to Eve back in the beginning. I think this is called an eye for an eye, tit for tat. Yeah. I when, mean, it's also the same thing that we've seen before with the Hebrew midwives, with yeah. Rahab. Like, this is, there's well, a well, bigger know, picture here. <laughs> the problem you know? is that a lot of these commentators do the same thing to those women, too. Yeah, which is not fair either. <laughs> which is not fair either, especially when God praises explicitly <laughs> the Hebrew midwives, and Rahab, and ranks her mm -hmm. with Sarah as a heroine of faith and with Abraham. But, you know, our, our presuppositions uh, with respect to gender roles can be exceedingly strong without being biblical. Mm -hmm. I've, I've told this story before. It's not a story. It's, just, it's a newspaper account or news account. It was in 2012. There was a young woman, her husband, I believe he was in the service, but he had recently died, I think, of cancer. And she's in the house. She's got their new baby, little little, little guy. And a couple of, of guys come to the door, and they're, uh, they've obviously been drinking, and they're saying things to her they shouldn't, and they're harassing her. But she manages to send them away and close and lock the door. But she's not feeling good about this. And after a while, she hears them back at the door pound, pounding and saying, let, let us in, let us in. Uh, and she goes to the phone and dials 911 and gets the police dispatcher and explains what's going on. I'm here alone with my little baby. There are two guys at the door. We are dispatching help to you immediately. That's great. It will be too late. 
Mm-hmm. I have my husband's shotgun. Uh, I have, to, I've got two guns in my hand. She says, is it okay to shoot him if he comes in this door? I'm here by myself with my infant baby. Uh, we actually, there's a, you can look this up. Uh, I got this from cbsnews.com 2012. The reporter was Sarah McKinley. Thank or is that, or maybe that's, no, I think that's the young lady herself, okay. depending on how I reference this. But she's saying he's, the, the door is about to give way. I have two guns and I have a baby. What do I do? And, and the operator, uh, hymns and haws, like, I can't tell you to shoot them. Um, uh, I, if I do not shoot them, they're going to come in and rape me and worse. What am I supposed to do? Do Is it legal for me to shoot them? I can't answer. I don't know what to, uh, the door is giving way. What am I supposed to do? Well, I can't tell you what to do, but you have to protect that baby at any cost. Thank you. <laughs> Puts the baby down, pulls the trigger, and um, they go down. And the next day, the DA, I believe this was in Texas, decides not to prosecute her for manslaughter, <laughs> and the case yes. is closed. Good. Yep. Yes, exactly. And yet, the problem, I, I suppose, the, the, the lack of connection between this and the jail story is that this lady doesn't invite them in to shoot them. She mm-hmm. actually waits until they break down the door. But then she's got a gun. Jail didn't. Mm-hmm. So it's a little different. But there's that same, why would there be a question of prosecuting this woman right. in 21st century America? Why would it even come up? Why is not the neighborhood celebrating her victory over wickedness and criminal activity, murderers and rapists, drunkenness? Why is there even a doubt here? Bible well, times, Bible stories, Bible people. Yeah, it, it was different back then, at least maybe for jail or maybe not. Um, so there you go. Um, one commentator, Daniel Block, writing in 1999 in his book on Judges, says jail's actions are not only deviant and violent, but socially revolutionary. Women should not defend themselves. So they should stand there and get raped. Or murder. Yeah, no. Or whatever. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. They, I, I, I can't. I, I really wish I could look some of these guys in the face and say, and if it were your daughter, if it were your wife, is that what you want? I don't think they really get it. I don't think they mm-hmm. understand what was going on here. I think they they kind of think that Cicero would just have, you know, gone to sleep and then got up and left and said thank you and left, you know, $20 on the pillow as a tip for her services, and that would be that. That's not the kind of guy you're dealing with. Maybe in a politer society 100 to 200 years ago, you might convince us that the bad guys are like this, unless you'd heard about these murders in Whitechapel by some guy named mm. Jack. I mean, th- th- there was a time when murders tended to actually have a point. You, you killed somebody <laughs> because... They had killed somebody, a friend of a relative of yours, or because you wanted their money, or because they were threatening her. The idea that someone might rape and kill a woman simply because she was handy, perhaps other generations just it didn't click with them. They just again, Bible people, Bible lands, Bible stories. You know. Well, also, the commentators are writing in a time yeah. where our society has been so shaped by ideas of propriety that yeah. grow out of this. Christian civilization. Yeah. That it's only because of the norms and the the restraining grace of God through this Christian civilization that we expect criminals to be polite at all, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, we love in stories, the affably evil people. Yeah. Yeah. The, the gentleman bandit and all that. Yeah. Who treats the lady with respect and all he wants is her diamonds. Yeah. And he'll see her safely home afterwards. That's not this guy. And as I say, next time we're going to see. So that's the final nail in the skull uh, <laughs> when Deborah describes how this whole society viewed women captives on the battlefield, what they were for. Well, but she wasn't. She belonged to this guy's household. We already know this guy is using Heber. He's ignoring mm-hmm. his his proper reign over his own sheikdom. He is ignoring his right to defend his wife. He's ignoring his wife's right to privacy. He has smashed through. He's brought the battle. I mean, uh, Barak shows up shortly. He's brought the battle right to them. This is not your ally. This is not your your drinking buddy. This is a guy who has been using you 
and he will use anything around you. And even if you say, well, you don't know that. Well, no, maybe we don't, but you don't know any better. And again, if it was your wife, it was your daughter, are you going to say, play it out and hope for the best, dear? I mean, surely he's not that bad. Really? Really? It's a sad thing. So anyway, next week we will we will look at um, Deborah's song. Uh, she spends, she's given an entire chapter by the people in the chapter break, but it's, it's a long song. And it's the longest thing that's put into the mouth of any woman in scripture for a long time, if not perhaps forever. I don't remember any other woman in scripture being given this much to say at once. Um, not even, uh, not even Hannah, I think. What about the Magnificat? Magnificat is actually fairly short. Yeah. It's shorter than Hannah's song. Uh, so th this is a big thing. Here is a woman who writes scripture. And when she writes scripture, she writes about what two things. What God in his, not simply his providence, but in his miraculous intervention does. And how he uses a woman to bring down a tyrant. Mm -hmm. Barak just gets, you know, passing reference. And, and the people who volunteered for the battle, the tribes get passing references. But the one who gets the lion, the two people who get the lion's share of the story are God in jail. <laughs> and thus you can see why some commentators might be uncomfortable with this. This isn't how God usually writes scripture. One, women writing it? What's that all about? You know, we're not sure of this prophetess thing in the first place. And she's a judge. Something sounds a little funny here. And then she gives credit to this other woman who lies and deceives and dupes and then kills somebody while he's asleep. I mean, yeah, no, I don't think I'm comfortable with any of this. But as I said, these are the same people who don't know what to do with Rahab and the Hebrew midwives. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's there's a parallel with Mary that's explicit in them both being called blessed among women. There's also a parallel with Eve back mm -hmm. in the garden. Yes. Where God is not talking to her husband. Yeah. <laughs> God has, he's had words with him briefly and he skived off his duty. So he moved on to talking to the woman, and then he talked to the serpent. And it's to the serpent that he says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. Yeah. So this is between the serpent and the woman, not between yeah. the serpent and the man. Yeah, the man's already screwed it up. The man had mm -hmm. his chance. And not until the seed of the woman, the new man, comes mm -hmm. will things actually be solved. And, and as for Adam, he's not going to have anything to do with it. At least theologically speaking. Yes, of course, Adam and Eve had a, ch a child who had children, who had children, who had children who eventually we need to marry and through her to Christ. But covenantally speaking, I, I caught myself on this the other day. We described the, the covenant of the Garden Gate as a covenant with Adam. Technically, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> right. It's, uh, it's, it's the, the covenant is with the seed. It's with Christ. But the one who is a stand-in as the, the representative who actually receives the promise is Eve. Mm -hmm. The woman who stands for God's people in general. So, yes, on multiple levels, we're talking about a preaching of the gospel. And when you try to criticize the woman's role here, you completely misunderstand what's going on. And you reduce it to a morality tale. Mm -hmm. Well, and the lesson children is... That <laughs> Always you... have a tent peg hand. <laughs> no, no, no. Trust <laughs> Trust God to rescue you and keep your tent pegs to yourself because, you know, your women, your, your, your girls and children, <laughs> afraid, and that's afraid man's work. Fra yes, exactly. Go be the flower and trust God to rescue you when the Nazis are at the door. I've always told my female students that they all need to learn how to fire a gun and they all need to own one and that they all need to take hard classes in the martial arts. Mm -hmm. Because our society is falling apart and you, do, you can't always have your dad there with his gut, assuming he has one. Mm -hmm. In our culture, that's not a, there's no guarantee of that anymore either. And, my, you know, my daughters all have knives. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my uh, my uh, nephew, Alex, was going to one of the local junior colleges. And for some reason, he was in the lab. And for some reason, he pulled out his knife. And the girl lab partner, uh, what is that? That's a weapon. No, that's a knife. It's a tool. <laughs> it's a tool. Yeah, he went on to explain how it's a tool and how, yes, in extreme circumstances, it can double as a weapon. 
But like an ox goad or yeah, a tent peg. Exactly. But she was just so horrified of the idea of imminent violence that she wanted to just put it away and told him he probably shouldn't even be carrying it or certainly he should not be bringing it to school because that's carrying a weapon around. Yeah. <laughs> that's Kids where, these days. Yeah, that's where societies come. It, it, it is one thing to say that in defense of the faith, we will submit to persecution or run for our lives, mm-hmm. not, not, not kill our persecutors. We have plenty of precedent for that. But when it comes to protecting your own life, your family, we also have plenty of precedent for that's when you bring out the sword. Peter, Jesus did not say to Peter, get rid of that sword. It has no place. He simply said, put it in its place. The sword does have a place. It's designed for self-defense or for use on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. That yeah. sword kind of comes out of the blue. Like we don't, we haven't seen that the disciples are routinely carrying swords around. But no. then we get to that point and it's assumed, oh, yeah, Peter has a sword, obviously, mm-hmm. and, of course. And so did someone else. They said, here are two swords. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they're they're going to be traveling the roads a lot. Despite Roman police efficiency on the highways, sometimes you needed to protect yourself. And so Peter mm-hmm. and someone else, they had swords. And Jesus' point is, swords don't win the kingdom, but they do have a place. This just isn't it right now. So put it up. And... So swords, weapons, tent pegs, frying pans have a place in our homes and in our lives. They're not instruments whereby we forward the gospel in most cases. And yet here, had she not used her tent peg very effectively, the whole future of the gospel would really have hung in the balance. God used her. And she didn't st- She didn't put on armor. She didn't pick up a sword. She didn't become Joan of Arc. She had what she had. And she used it effectively, fearlessly, or as far as we can see such things, courageously at least, to fight for the kingdom of God. And the fact that the first thing out of her mouth was not, praise Jehovah for his greatness. I mean, really. (laughs) Nothing you do is valid unless you immediately (laughs) thank God for it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, We don't know what she said. We're not... (laughs) can look at many of the prophets and and, and the mighty men in in Scripture, you know, Sure, David, in the cool of the moment a month later, could write a psalm giving all the glory to God. (laughs) But we don't have out of his mouth, even at the defeat of going into the battle with Goliath. He says, God's going to give me in your hand. But once he takes off the head, he doesn't stand and say, let us all now pray. Let's make sure all the glory goes to God right now, right now with every every head bowed, every eye closed. He just, (laughs) grab your swords and go after them, guys. He finishes cutting off the head, even though Goliath's already dead. Yeah. He empties the magazine. It's not just one shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's yeah. let's make sure this guy's really dead. Mm. So, yeah. more of Deborah and Jail next time, and maybe mm-hmm. in the meantime, someone can call us feminists or anarchists or something. Yeah. Well, average police response time in the U.S. is ten minutes. Mm. A lot can happen in ten minutes that you don't want happen. to happen. Yep. Well, again, ending on such a cheery note. (laughs) Let's have some recommendations. I have a recommendation. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm ready. Go for it. All right. I'm going to recommend the the, the OG musical about the founding of our country, 1776. Ah! Oh! Ah, really? Yes. We just watched this again the other night with with some friends. And uh, the movie version. I've never seen it on stage, but the movie version with... um, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he plays Mr. Feeney in Boy Meets World. He portrays John Adams. Oh, yes. And he was he's, a stage actor, too, I believe. He's what? I believe he was the original stage actor, at least when I saw it oh. as a teenager. I think it was. I'd have to go look at pictures, but I believe so. He's super great. It's one of the best portrayals of John Adams. You know, this is kind of the weird thing about theater and history and trying to do history in theater is that what makes for good history and what makes for good theater are two different things right like in good history you don't want to idealize the narrative you don't want to make things up in theater you want to idealize it to (laughs) take advantage of the the tropes and the things that we know as the audience right? right but the wonderful thing about history and theater overlapping is 
the canon of characters that you get to work with Mm -hmm. because you know there's so much documentation of what john adams was like Mm -hmm. there's so much documentation of who these people were and what their motivations were and so you can get a really vivid picture of who they are and then you get to see it come to life with an actor yeah Um, so the portrayal of john adams is just on point super stellar uh, it does contain some body humor, yeah. <laughs> but it also portrays most endearingly one of history's best documented healthy and loving marriages that yeah. is John and Abigail Adams. Yeah. So I think it's lovely and humorous. And I know a lot of people who grew up on the movie and were not too terribly warped by it. So I, <laughs> I fully intend to show it to my children. <laughs> they won't get the net, the the naughty jokes anyway yeah, you hope <laughs> i watched uh, the music man growing up that was fine i didn't get it until i was 13 it's like yeah, I, I, mom I, you yeah. let me watch this <laughs> you know that's that's me with star trek and my girls i want you to see this sci-fi thing that i grew up with well, a second let me go back and double oh wow <laughs> I mean, there's only like three episodes in the whole series where kirk isn't trying to seduce some woman on the bridge <laughs> Okay, girls, you get to see these three, and they're all remarkably like it. There's some big alien thing about to kill everybody and they <laughs> do something with it. Uh, anyway, um, my recommendation is is somewhat qualified. Well, it's it's unqualified pretty much with regard to the book. It's qualified with respect to the author. James B. Jordan wrote a commentary on Judges, which I think is called, it's called something like the Commentary on Judges, or simply Judges. It is one of the best pieces of biblical theology that I know of. Uh, The problem is that uh, Reverend Jordan continued his theological career out of biblical theology, using it sometimes as an excuse to run away from traditional covenant thinking into the realm of questioning, if not flat out denying justification by faith. Mm. So I can't, I'm not recommending the author in general, particularly where his later works are concerned and some of his newsletters, some of his early work was really, really stellar and fantastic. And this commentary, to the best of my memory, I can recommend without qualification. You want to hear, you want a book that talks about some of the things we're talking about. Uh, James Jordan on Judges. Uh, it's probably been on a print for a while, but you might find a used copy someplace. And if nothing else, it will teach you how to go, teach you how biblical theology is done. How do you look at a passage and not turn it into a moral parable? Mm -hmm. How do you look at a passage and see Jesus? How do you see the bigger covenant connections? So I do recommend it for that, although not giving much praise to the author in his latter years. Thank you very much. And thanks for this conversation. It's been a delight. Uh, Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash Zion. If you would like to send us an email, please feel free to do so. You can reach us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. You can leave us a five-star review or however many stars you think we deserve. Um, I mean, like, I would like the five-star. I get the dopamine hit. <laughs> <laughs> But leave us a review. Uh, Let us know what you think. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.